Okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, today we are reviewing the work from sprints 80 and 81. This looks different. Let me try that again. Oh, I guess it's just been enlarged. All right, so you can see uh, the standard intro slides with all of the teams and what they're working on. Um, we do have, get back to presentation mode. <clears throat> we do have one um, new permanent team member. Let me see if I can find them here. Uh, here we go, Pavlo on Spitfire. So welcome, Pavlo. And we also have some other um, EPAM developers who will be shadowing on, on other teams um, while they're waiting for their team to form. Um, so um, some of you may have heard we'll be forming a new team um, soon to focus on um, simple or single mark record editing um, with Stephanie Buck as the product owner. So we'll get those guys up on a slide when that team is formed. And that brings us to the Fameflower release timeline. And I'm going to turn it over to Jakob to talk us through this. Are you on, Jakob? I am uh, just having trouble finding the right button here. Give me a second. There you go. OK. Um, Hello, everybody. Uh, so a quick update on the release timeline. I know that it's been um, uh, awaited by everybody. There is uh, there seems to be some background noise. Uh, can we mute? Uh, yeah, maybe? I can mute everybody. Let me see here. Um, mute all. And then I have to unmute you, Jakob, or you can do it yourself. Might be easier. Yep, thank you. OK, Thanks, good. Cool. All right. So, guys, a quick update on the on the release timeline. Uh, we'll start uh, earlier this time around. Uh, we had uh, we had uh, to delay the previous release, as you remember, uh, due to um, uh, uh, a couple of different issues uh, with uh, with module releases. So this time around, we're trying to accommodate this and and allow for a, a little bit more time uh, for uh, preparing the releases. Uh, integrating them and also a little bit more time for actual bug fixing. So, so this timeline is longer than than the previous one, but 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 should be uh, should allow for more time for those uh, those important activities. So, we'll start off with uh, on the third of March. Uh, that's Tuesday, uh, and by that date, um, all platform components, including all copies, stripes, R and B, will have uh, final releases ready. Um, by final, I of course. I uh, mean, uh, functionally final. There might be some further bug fix releases beyond that date, especially if bugs get discovered as uh, as, uh, as, uh, as with, with the module releases themselves. So, third of March, uh, those releases will be out. Thirteenth uh, of March, that's Friday. Um, so, ten days after, we will have the module release deadline. So, by that by that date, um, all modules must have Q1 compatible releases. Meaning that uh, uh, that the releases must be prepared and and, and built uh, and and released according to the Folio release guidelines. Um, so that's no different than what we've done in previous quarters. Uh, once uh, once those releases are out, uh, we're allowing for a week after that. It's not it's not here on, uh, on 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 this slide, but we're allowing for a week of integration where uh, um, uh, we would uh, try to construct the release candidate environment. Uh, there might be some release issues discovered with individual modules, some dependency problems. Uh, so uh, we're hoping the week is enough uh, to resolve them, uh, which will then let us construct the bug fix environment and update the bug fix environment with the, with the Q1 release candidate. And, that will, and then the bug fix will start on the 23rd of March. And it will take a week as usual um uh immediately with the first uh, uh test cases uh, executed uh, during the bug fest bugs 
uh, for any discovered bugs, uh, bug reports will be created, and those will be immediately triaged by the by the bug triaging team. And if they are deemed um, uh, uh, Q1 2020 um, uh, uh, blockers, then they, they will be uh, uh, will be put in in the development pipeline, and they will be addressed by individual teams and fixed. So so that will commence immediately when the bug fix commences and we when we get results from the first test cases run. Bug fix will take until the 27th of March and then we'll also have the following week to provide bug fix releases and also the following Monday. So the, the bug fix release deadline is on the 6th of April uh, and, and, and hopefully we can we can have a um, a stable release by that date and we're planning to announce uh, the uh, Q1 release on the 10th of April. Uh, that's Friday. Uh, so that's awesome. the timeline. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that, like last time when we did our bug fest, there were, I think, a good number of bugs that hadn't been triaged even at the end. So starting with the triage and being really good about making sure we're we're fixing the important things as soon as they come in will save us some time here. All right, Adelaide's All right. hot fix releases. I think we can skip that in the and uh, no matter to say something. Oh yeah. Uh, it's okay. it's the same. We've covered that. Uh, yeah, sprint highlights. Uh, those are actually the two demos that will be shown today from the platform team. So I'll okay. just turn it turn it up to you, Kate. Uh, I just have a request. When we start demos, could you, um, um, you know, let you guys let go first? Introduce. Yeah, and, and 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 let me just introduce what uh, what are the features that we're going to be talking about. Thanks. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Well, that's um, really all we had to talk about um, before we got to the demos. So as usual, we have all the highlights summarized on the slides. And eventually I will get to the list of people who are going to demo. Um, and I did put you first, Jakob, because I think you needed to go. So I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you. Um... Can I take over screen sharing? Yep, if I stop. Uh, pause, stop share. Thanks. So uh, I won't be speaking for too long. I'll just turn it, uh, uh, turn the microphone to, uh, to Ian and John who will be talking about the individual features. So just a word of introduction. Um, we will be demoing the, the the platform team will be demoing two the, the DevOps team will be demoing two features. Um, one uh, both are powered by the Kubernetes cluster environment that's been set up for Folio uh, in Q4. Um, that's a new Folio infrastructure that we hope to use um, uh, for all Folio environments going forward. First of those features that Ian will be talking about that's the continuous uh, snapshot environment. Uh, that's essentially a purpose-built environment that um, unlike the existing Folio snapshot and Folio snapshot stable and Folio testing, so all those existing reference environments, that's a, uh, an environment that is continuously upgraded, uh, which means that this environment does not get rebuilt every night. Uh, it is um, uh, continuously upgraded with new module releases. Um, so whenever a new module release um, is available, uh, uh, there's an automatic process in the, uh, in the continuous integration um, uh, infrastructure that, uh, that picks that new release, builds that, uh, makes it available, and updates the environment um, to use the, the, the new release. Which means that uh, this environment can be, can be used for, um, uh, for um, uh, for additional testing compared to the existing reference environments, uh, including testing uh, migration scripts that are provided with, uh, for individual schema changes. Uh, so the old, old environment did not have that capability because it, uh, it was rebuilt and, and uh, uh, every night and preloaded with sample data, this environment stays online uh, and it's still using sample data, but it will trigger migration to provide a uh, migration path for the data, for the sample data that's provided along with the modules. So we're hoping to um, at least uh, surface some of the potential migration issues um, early um, uh, this time around 
uh, not without waiting to the very end of the quarter uh, and doing a, a full-blown end-to-end test. Um, so that's one. The other functionality that John will be talking about is the, is the pull request preview functionality, which also builds on the same uh, Kubernetes infrastructure. Uh, that's, an, uh, that's a functionality that takes it a step further, which allows um, uh, deployment of individual feature branches in addition to uh, release and snapshot branches that we currently uh, use in Folio to, uh, um, um, uh, to deploy existing reference environments. So in practice, that means that a feature can be deployed and it can be tested, it can be reviewed in isolation uh, before that code is merged uh, to the mainline branch, which is in this case master in Folio. Um, uh, this is combined with the pull request um, workflow in GitHub, so that uh, uh, the, the the automation build is um, the, the the build is automated, and those steps, deployment steps, uh, and build and deployment steps and test steps, if we choose to, uh, ha can happen automatically. And John will be talking more about this, so I'll, I won't get into uh, into much detail. And I think the guys also have some slides that they uh, they hopefully will be useful for. Um, for you guys to, to, to understand how the solution has been provided. I just have uh, attached one slide to the, um, uh, to the, the, the sprint review uh, slides, which, uh, which has a you know, 10,000 foot view over the solution. So we essentially have a Kubernetes cluster, which, is, uh, which has two namespaces right now, one for preview, um, uh, for the preview environment, for the pull request preview environment, um, or ad hoc environments, that's going to be created by individual teams and another namespace which is used for uh, deploying snapshot which is master branches and releases so anything that has to do with uh, with those final releases that we deliver each quarter um, and the the, the 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 part below the the blue part that can power um, uh, environments similar to the reference environments we currently have with the addition of that continuous behavior so those environments can actually stay up for a longer time and they can be uh, automatically upgraded um, and uh, the top part the green part that allows uh, that addition of deployment for feature branches the feature functionality that's not being matched to master uh, some of which might be still uh, in development uh, but it can be shared for early preview and with that being said i'll just turn to ian i think ian do you want to go ahead Sure, yeah. Hello. Um, no, hold on. Let's see. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so this is uh, one of the environments that Jacob was talking about, which is um, just a continuous build of uh, platform core. Um, it's not much to look at, you know. Um, it looks like platform core, hopefully. Um, but uh, one difference we've got is that we um, are preserving the data in this and then running upgrades uh, every so often. Uh, I've got an hourly timer right now, which I've paused for the presentation, um, uh, to, to allow upgrades to occur. Um, so I'll show the, the, the Jenkins job real quick. is um, called Snapshot Core Cates here. Um, I'll just go ahead and kick it off now for kicks. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about how this is working. Um, uh, there's sort of two phases to it. Um, it's at, well, first of all, it's not snapshot at core continuous dot dev dot full uh, and then the credentials are here. Um, the first thing that happens is module deployment, which is um, uh, running those containers on that Kubernetes cluster. And that's done um, as master branch is built. Um, then the container is deployed, but it's not immediately enabled. Uh, and I just highlighted the step in the, um, the Jenkins file that I've added to a bunch of the uh, platform core backend modules to enable that. So you might've seen that going into your modules lately. Um, and then what's what's going on right now is it's gonna build, it's gonna clone platform core and build the Stripes platform uh, and then use Okapi to resolve the latest dependencies, backend modules dependencies uh, that are required to support that build. And then it'll um, it'll throw those requirements at the install endpoint, 
Uh, and if nothing's changed, nothing will happen. Uh, but if a module is gone forward to version, uh, it will trigger an update. Uh, and then finally, it'll reassign permissions uh, and then um, publish the Stripes bundle. Um, so that's 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 basically it right now. That's that's what's occurring now. Um, one thing that's kind of nice about it is that a lot of the work has already been done uh, in terms of deploying the modules and the infrastructure. Uh, it doesn't take very long. I think it takes about six or seven minutes, and it should be mostly um, you know mostly available during this process. Um, so that's, that's another kind of nice thing too. Um, and I'll just mention that I had been running uh, integration tests on this, but I, I, I stopped them um, because um, we're not sure that since it's a clean enough environment to do integration tests since the data is persisting. So there's going to be a little bit sort of evolution on that in terms of you know how, how often we should reset and clean this up. Uh, but that's sort of uh, still under consideration. Um, and that's, that's really all I've got. Uh, is there any questions that I can try to answer? Thanks, Ian. I, if people have questions afterwards, should they reach out to you on Slack or so? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, you can reach me um, at Ian on Slack or uh, post in the DevOps channel. Uh, that would be great. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so next up for demos is Thunderjet and Dennis is gonna kick it off. Uh, Kate, can we, can we let John also Oh, is John gonna show something as well? Got it, yeah, of course. Thank you. John, are you on? Yeah, hey guys, thanks. Um, let me see if I can share my screen as well. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, kind of run through uh, the PR preview uh, concept and, uh, you know, how it works, um, the process for putting it up and for It is, I'm not going to actually demonstrate it uh, because we don't want to sit, sit around here and watch builds happen uh, on Jenkins. So um, I'll just kind of walk through it. Um, so this concept of PR preview is uh, something I think that's becoming increasingly uh, popular uh, in the DevOps world. It's essentially, you know, the ability to uh, uh, build a full uh, application stack uh, with your feature branch code uh, before uh, merging uh, that code into uh, your master branch. Uh, so there was, you know, some complications uh, just uh, uh, w with us implementing this sort of uh, having to do with scope and uh, priorities and the way we do API compa compa uh, compatibility stuff with uh, dependency resolution and so forth. But I think we got something uh, that's fairly decent now, uh, could use a little bit of refinement, but uh, here we are. Um, so. Um, branch preview mode uh, basically allows developers, product owners, and others to, uh, you know, preview changes in a feature branch uh, on the live Folio system. So essentially what we do is uh, build a tenant, a Folio tenant, enable modules for that tenant, build a Stripes bundle, uh, and host that uh, so that users can use it. Um, <clears throat> Currently, we uh, can do a, a full or partial Folio uh, preview build um, based on either the platform complete or platform core repositories. Um, and these repositories are essentially uh, Folio build configurations. Uh, they consist of um, you know, the lists of uh, front end and back end modules uh, that we're going to use to build 
uh, the, the preview system or any kind of folio system for that matter. Um, and uh, I guess one of the uh, things that Jakob talked about earlier was the ability to substitute. Um, well, I should first say that, you know, the, the platform complete and platform core repositories are repositories that, uh, or at least the ma master branches of those repositories sort of define our release builds. And so we use um, actual release module releases as sort of the baseline uh, for each build. And then on top of that, you can substitute uh, release modules for uh, back end and front end uh, feature branches or even uh, uh, master branch uh, builds as well. Um, and so I'll go through that as well. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to use um, I'm going to use an, an example of um, a, a PR preview where we have um, a, a back end and a front end developer maybe working uh, in tandem to implement a new feature in the tags application. Um, so we have a, a, the back end module, which is mod tags, and the front end module, uh, UI tags. And so uh, what we're going to do is build that back end module, um, the mod tags deploy it to the Kubernetes cluster. Um, and then we're going to uh, open up a PR uh, in platform core and specify the feature branch of UI tags. Um, and then we're going to uh, build a tenant with those feature branches. Um, and uh, and build, a, I build an instance. So um, the steps basically are uh, for the backend branch module. Uh, each of the backend uh, modules have a Jenkins file, um, which is a configuration file for our CI. Um, there's a few uh, options uh, that you need to set in that Jenkins file or in order for this to work. Um, Ian mentioned uh, in, his, in his presentation the uh, uh, do cube deploy uh, parameter here, which uh, essentially deploys a uh, Docker artifact onto uh, the Kubernetes cluster. So that needs to be set to true. And then we uh, also need to set um, the publish preview parameter uh, in a couple places here, actually in two places, uh, set those to true as well. Um, so essentially what that does is um, makes the module uh, available to um, our preview environment. So what we do, um, the next step there is after we've, um, you know, committed our file, our Jenkins file up to our branch, our feature branch, uh, we'll open a PR for that module branch, um, which will initiate, initiate, uh, initiate a build of that module and deploy it to uh, the cluster. Um, there's a, a versioning scheme that we use uh, for these specific builds. Um, I've uh, detailed it here. Um, essentially, it's uh, the uh, version of the module specified in the palm of the branch, um, as, long, uh, as well as the, uh, the PR number here. Uh, this 35 would be a PR number. Um, and the one in would indicate it's the first build in Jenkins of this uh, pull request. So assuming uh, that build is successful, uh, we have a backend feature branch module that's been deployed. Um, and now what we want to do is um, go over to uh, the platform core repository in this case and uh, specify we're going to get check that out, create a branch, a feature branch of platform core uh, that we use for this uh, preview. Um, there's a file we need to create in that branch um, and it's called .pr custom depths. And what we're going to do here is uh, just specify that we want to substitute the mod tags release uh, that's normally uh, included uh, with our feature branch uh, module. Uh, which in which in this case is this mod tags uh, uh, module we just built. 
Um, you can list multiple modules here in this file. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, you might have to because you might want to specify, say, uh, a mod inventory module, uh, and that might have you know, other dependencies that rely, say, on uh, newer snapshot uh, versions of that module. Uh, so this uh, very much looks like uh, an Okapi uh, uh, install JSON file, a tenant uh, install file. Um, and next we're going to uh, edit our package.json file. Uh, and this is where we specify the feature branch of the UI tags module uh, that we want to include in our build. Um, and uh, NPM has a nice feature where we can uh, specify a branch uh, right in package.json uh, by specifying uh, where uh, you know, the repository is in GitHub as well as the branch. And so here I've specified that we're going to use a feature branch called PR, PR uh, preview test um, instead of um, an actual release artifact. Uh, so we're going to save all that, commit it um, to our branch, and we're going to open a pull request uh, against the master branch um, in platform core. Um, so like I said earlier, the, uh, the modules that will be used, uh, the backend modules are all specified in uh, a file called a copy install JSON. Um, you don't need to edit that file, uh, it's just there for reference. Um, and like I said, uh, any custom dependencies will be uh, substituted in uh, over that book copy install JSON file that we created. Um, during this process, um, during the build process, a, a Stripes bundle for the tenant is built and uh, that is uh, deployed to an Amazon S3 bucket. Um, and that's where um, you know we'll uh, that that's where we'll connect to get our get access to the bundle, um, and uh, uh, the information about accessing the URL uh, to reach the bundle, as long as well as the uh, tenant admin username, those will be um, uh, actually uh, uh, listed in the uh, in the PR uh, comments. The pull, pull request comments here. Um, you can see here uh, where we've deployed a tenant called Platform Core uh, 533 underscore five, uh, which is the fifth build of uh, PR 533 uh, in Platform Core. Uh, and then the link to the, uh, to the instance we built is here. <clears throat> And for whatever reason, I need to refresh or something here. Let's see if this one works. Oh, huh, well, something is up with my browser, I think. But that instance is there. Um, and is uh, you know you just log in and and and, reg and use it like any regular uh, Filio instance. Um, so I think that's about it. We do have um, just some notes about this, um, as far as um, you know retention of backend modules that we build and deploy to Kubernetes. Uh, there's a cleanup job that runs um, that sort of goes through and cleans up old snapshots that aren't being used that have been deployed as well as um, uh, older releases past the last three releases. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, you know, if you need to um, deploy uh, an older version of a module, um, you know, that could be an issue, but I don't necessarily see that as something uh, that would be done frequently. Um, 
there could be multiple build iterations for a pull request here uh, for PR preview. So you could, you know, open your PR, let it build, uh, it'll create the tenant. Um, but if you uh, want to modify that, that pull request, um, it will create a new tenant uh, and a new stripes bundle. But the, the only the stripes bundle from the last build is actually retained. Um, and the tenant and the uh, S3 bucket um, that contains, contains our stripes bundle uh, is, uh, will remain available uh, until the actual uh, PR is closed. Uh, so that's it. Um, you know, there's a couple of um, tweaks and things that we need to do, I think, to make this widely available uh, for use. Um, I think our, our biggest obstacle at this point is really one of compute resources. I think that, um, you know, if we enable this for all folio modules um, and we all start doing preview builds, uh, that's going to create um, Oh, that's going to create a lot of builds and, and resource utilization, especially uh, around uh, Stripe's bundle compilation and that sort of thing. So we need to solve that problem uh, really to scale this out uh, to all modules. Uh, we currently have it enabled for uh, core modules uh, and platform core. Uh, those are the basic uh, mod inventory, mod, mod circulation type modules. Um, and we also have some documentation on this whole process, which is uh, posted on the dev website. Um, I don't think there's a link directly to it yet, uh, so we still need to uh, to uh, add that link. Yeah, it'd be awesome if we could um, get links to your deck and to Ian's deck and that documentation, get that all organized together, maybe in the sprint review deck or something so people can access it later, because I'm sure there'll be questions. And I'm gonna just stop you here, John, because we do have a bunch of other um, presentations to do, but if sure. people have questions, should they also reach out on the DevOps channel? Yeah, the DevOps channel is the, the best way. Okay, Thank all you. right, thank you so much. This looks great. Thank you, guys. Um, okay, all right, so now uh, Thunderjet with Dennis kicking off. Thanks, Kate. So I'm, I think we actually have, I'm a little biased, but a very, really exciting demo uh, today. We're going to show a substantial amount of stuff, but in a short period of time. So it's going to be really focused. If you want to know more about this stuff, please join us in resource management SIG. We'll be going into more detail. Um, what we're showing really was driven by a need to be able to order packages of titles. So it's going to have to do with basically receiving. Um, I'm just going to show the changes that were made to the order. So I've created a purchase order with a purchase order line that is intended to be a package of titles. We're paying for one thing, we're getting multiple titles, and we may need to receive multiple titles. So the first thing that you'll notice that we've changed, obviously, in search uh, and filter for order lines, you have search by title or package name. And in the results, you'll see um, title or package name. When we, when we look at the order itself, filtered by. When you look at the order itself and you see the purchase order line, it's now title or package name. And that is because when you create a purchase order line, you're able to indicate that this is actually for a package of titles. So it starts by. Uh, toggling that this purchase order lines for a package and that's going to change the information slightly that you're collecting in your order so it's no longer a title now it's a it's a package name and it's going to affect some of the receiving workflow by uh, what we used to call check-in items is now a toggle for manually adding pieces for receiving and the reason for that is because all of the receiving whether you're doing uh, sort of more classical receiving based on quantities or you're checking in items that you may have ordered, you know, one package and be checking in 12 items through the course of the year. In those types of workflows, we're doing all of those things in one specific place, which is the new receiving 
UI. So once we create an order for something, we still have, let's get those orders back here quickly. We still have the ability to click on this receive items link, but that's now going to take us to the receiving user interface. So from here, I'm going to pass it over to Alexi and he's going to show you, uh, in this case, for this order, we already have a title that exists. If we ordered a package of things, we might be adding multiple titles and relating them to that order for receiving. Um, Alexi, I think, is going to show us uh, adding a title for receiving and adding pieces for that title. And beyond that, a lot of the workflow is very similar, but this portion is quite a bit different. So I'll turn things over to Alexi. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, great introduction uh, regarding packaging on PO lines. Uh, so I prepared um, one order, purchase order, with several uh, purchase order lines. Uh, one is uh, uh, regular connected to the instance. Uh, uh, so and um, which doesn't require many reagent pieces for a scene. And uh, the second one uh, is also package. Uh, so it uh, definitely requires uh, 18 pieces memory. So on uh, opening the order, uh, the title for this one uh, PO line sh should be created automatically, and uh, this uh, uh, demo test package will be handled uh, manually. So let's go to the uh, first one. We can go to the receive, receiving application, um, and uh, basically what uh, we have done is uh, uh, we leveraged uh, code uh, of functionality regarding receiving into a separate application. So now we uh, at receiving application and uh, here is a list filtered by purchase order uh, line number from where we have come. And um, here, uh, automatically created title uh, and more of this uh, we have two pieces uh, since the quantity was uh, two for this purchase order line uh, but uh, for the second uh, plan we have to create a title manually so we go to the new title screen and uh, search our uh, push the line, uh, we can uh, see the uh, filters is by our demo test package name. So we select, we fetch uh, receiving node and uh, some uh, checkbox that will show us that receiving node on uh, creating pieces or receiving. So uh, let's check it and uh, we have to uh, provide some title information. It, uh, so on this moment, we created a title. Uh, here, uh, our pieces thing, uh, and we can create uh, a piece. Uh, since we checked uh, the uh, acknowledge uh, receiving not uh, checkbox, we just have this confirmation is that uh, receiving not from the purchaser line. And we can create several pieces. Uh, here, specify uh, the same information that was implemented before in uh, all your orders, uh, but uh, here we go. Mm. So here we have uh, our pieces that 
could be edited. Uh, and then, um, uh, as well, we can uh, actually create new title for the same push third line. Uh, as many as we want. Uh, and uh, to provide different uh, inventory instances. Uh, yeah, and uh, as uh, I mentioned, uh, since uh, we, we moved all leveraged functionality from the order app to the separate application, we can receive it uh, as well. Uh, in, we have uh, changed the uh, view. Previously, it was a table with model windows. But not, right now, it's a list of pieces and the model window of receiving. We can specify a call number, barcode that uh, will be provided to the inventory item and uh, location. So we received one piece, yes, and it's, uh, it goes to the received pane. Uh, basically, that's it from my side, I believe. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Alexei and Dennis. That does look really cool. Uh, good progress. So next up, we have Spitfire, and Khalil is going to kick that demo off. Yes, uh, thanks, Kate. Uh, good day, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to kick off the uh, the demos that Maxim and uh, Vlad will do. Uh, first, Maxim is going to show, and it'll be on his local machine, um, the, the front-end development work we've been doing on custom fields. Um, uh, we thought it'd be great to show it uh, during the system demo because uh, Maxim and the team's done uh, um, a great job in, in getting the front-end um, kind of outlined and developed related to custom fields. And I know a lot of folks have actually asked about our development related to custom fields. So from a back end perspective, much, most of custom field development is, is, is complete as far as uh, what we were planning to do for Q1. Uh, so really most of the work now is the front end. And so uh, that's what we'll show today uh, on a local environment. Um, Custom fields will initially be applied to a user record, and then over time, uh, they will be available for other apps to, to take advantage of. Um, on February 26th, uh, at the user management SIG, we'll talk more about the work we've done on the back end, uh, as far as back end development goes related to custom fields. Uh, so if anybody wants to join that, uh, that um, presentation or demo, that again will be at the user management SIG on February 26. And with that said, Maxim will demo custom fields and then Vlad will demo uh, a feature that's, uh, that only applies to e-holdings, which is custom labels. And so I'm going to now cede the floor to, uh, to Maxim. Uh, thanks, Google. Hello. Can I go see my screen? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so um, I'm on the settings of the user's app, um, and you can see that there is a new item in the list called custom fields. Um, if we go to custom fields, um, we will see the list of custom fields configured for user's application. Uh, the list is empty, so let's edit it and let's custom fields. And you can see that currently we only support custom fields of type text field. In the future, we will implement more types of custom fields like radio buttons, checkboxes, uh, I guess multiple selection, single selection, and so on. Text area also, yep. So let's create a text field. Uh, now we have to provide the data related this text field so uh, the data will look differently for each type of custom fields uh, in case of text field we only have to say uh, if the field will be visible on the user record if it's required 
we also have to provide the label for that field in some custom field and we can provide if we need the help text for this custom field uh, and create a couple of more custom fields I'll click save and you can see that the list of custom fields is updated with all of the information that we were just provided. We can edit the list. So let's, for example, update the first field um, and I would like to remove the third field. Uh, now when I click save, uh, I will see this model saying that if I delete custom fields too, uh, then the data which is stored for that custom fields will be also deleted. And you can see that currently uh, we haven't saved any data for this custom field in any records. See the uh, zero records. And that's obvious because we, we have just created that custom field. So I will click save uh, and you can see that the list of custom fields is updated correctly. Mm, I guess that's all I had. I think I didn't miss anything. Thank you. Thanks, Maxim. That's awesome to see. Um, all right. I guess Vlad is next up. Uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, wait a second. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Uh, okay, uh, let's start. Uh, over the past uh, two sprints, uh, we have been working on a new feature called uh, custom labels. Uh, it's new to describe what does it mean. Uh, an electronic resource librarian could create and update custom labels on resource details uh, records uh, so that he can provide additional details about uh, the records to patrons and to staff. Uh, in the settings uh, we hold in, we can see in the new pane is custom labels. Uh, it is a form uh, in which we are provided uh, with up to five possible custom labels. Uh, we can see these labels on the resource uh, in page here they are uh, so uh, let's rename uh, the first one and uh, save it uh, uh, when we update uh, the resource uh, page we can see that uh, this uh, label is renamed to uh, if we want to delete uh, the custom label uh, we can just uh, fill this field uh, like an empty and uh, save. Uh, then we can see the remove confirmation model. If we click, click to remove custom labels, uh, this uh, label will be deleted successfully. Uh, and uh, let's update uh, the resource page. and uh, this uh, label uh, removed too. Uh, if we change something in the form um, and uh, let's move to uh, another page, we see the uh, navigation model. Uh, and uh, if we want to delete uh, the label, if we had uh, one of checkboxes clicked, checked, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we see the uh, error message. So um, now we see on the record page that uh, all custom labels have uh, an empty um, values uh, with which uh, looks like a dashes. So we can uh, change them, uh, click on edit 
and uh, find the uh, custom labels accordion. Uh, here we can add uh, some values and save it. And uh, on the uh, view page, we can see that the values changed uh, successfully. So uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Vlad. Looks great. Um, okay, let's move on to Foley Jet with Anne Marie. All right, just a quick intro, and then I'm going to turn this over to Alexi. Um, we had wanted to show uh, the the way that the profiles associate with each other, specifically the um, the action and field mapping profiles. But late last night, we found a, a problem with the way that they were um, displaying. So we've got a bug that we have to fix before we can show that. So in the meantime, though, um, one of the pieces of backend work that we've done in this in these last couple sprints is to hook up the source record storage to the HRID um, prefix and um, member sequencer uh, generator that is stored in the inventory settings so that when a new source mark record is created, it will honor those settings. So that's what Alexi is going to show. Hi all, let me share my screen. We having troubles, Alexi? Hello? Alexi. Did we lose him? Alexi. Okay, sorry. Some That's okay. Are you able to? Yeah. <laughs> okay. There it okay. comes. Uh, uh, do you see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, so during uh, the previous sprint, we had some improvements in our uh, default data import process, and um, we include a new functionality to handling a human readable ID uh, when uh, we create uh, instances from Mark records. Uh, so let me. Uh, demonstrate it. I try to upload uh, one test file using our uh, default mapping and load mark bibliographic records button. <sighs> Couple of seconds, yeah. So um, if we uh, go into logs after uh, importing the uh, mark um, uh, mark pip file uh, we can find that uh, in uh, all OO1 uh, tags uh, we have a um, um, human readable id of uh, created instance uh, but uh, previous value of uh, all one field uh, was moved to all 35 field and if we try to find this instance by human readable id okay so that's it and um, um, the uh, main um, functionality that we added uh, for Azure ID handling was uh, uh, handling the O O one field when we um, importing a mark record. Uh, if it exists, we move it to O35 field and um, in um, during the creating of instance, uh, um, mod inventory generate a next uh, value for human readable ID and we assign this value into our uh, record in 
SRS for 001 uh, tag, and also uh, we recalculate a leader uh, for uh, this parsed record, so it, it's a valid record for us. So uh, I think uh, that's all from me. If you have some questions, please ask. Yes, so kind of in the guts there, but um, key thing is it's only happening when new records are created in source record storage and it's following the, the inventory settings. There'll be a different handling for the HRIDs when it's updating records in source record storage, which we haven't taken care of yet. Nice, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, Vega is next with Alexander and then Roman. Hi, it's Roman. I'll start and okay. then Alex will proceed. Sounds good. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it now? Yep. Good. So I'd like to demo automatic item blocks. Uh, the purpose of this uh, feature is to block pattern from uh, checking out more items than allowed by institution. Uh, the institution may have limits specified by pattern group, uh, loan type, material type, or, or combination of them. These uh, loan limits are set in the item limit field of the loan policy. Uh, when an item is scanned uh, at checkout, the loan policy is checked to see what the item limit is. If the item is uh, reached, uh, the pattern will not be allowed to check out the item and the error, uh, error model will appear. So now I'm going to uh, configure uh, item limit for material type. I already created a circulation rule uh, with a material type book. Uh, this rule uses a loan policy one hour. Uh, I will set limit to items for a loan policy one hour. Uh, save. Uh, I've prepared uh, the list of barcodes uh, uh, for all test cases. And let's try to check out three uh, items with material type book. Uh, first one. Second one. And uh, the third one, we should, uh, on the third one, we should get uh, an error that uh, item limit has been reached. Yeah, we got error that says uh, pattern uh, has reached maximum limit of two items for material type. Uh, well, I'll check the mean. And uh, now I'm going to uh, configure our item limit for loan type. I will update the circulation rule with loan type uh, can cir circulate. Save. And uh, now let's try to check out three items with loan type can circulate. First one, second one. Uh, and during the third checkout, we will get error message that uh, says that item limit uh, has been reached. Pattern has reached the maximum limit of two items for loan type. Okay, I uh, will check them in.
And the uh, third scenario that I wanted to show, it's a combination of material type, loan type, and pattern group. Um, I will update uh, the circulation rule uh, with material type text, uh, loan type can circulate, and pattern group faculty. I already prepared this rule. Text uh, can circulate and uh, pattern group faculty. Save. And now let's try to check out the items with combination of these uh, conditions. First one. The second one. And during the search account, we should get uh, error message. Pattern has reached maximum limit of two, uh, two items for combination of pattern group, material type, and loan type. Uh, but if I check out uh, an item with uh, another material type or loan type, uh, this item uh, will, will be check out, checked out uh, successfully. Uh, for example, let's try this one. Uh, or this one. Yeah. So probably, probably that's it uh, that I wanted to show. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Roman. That was a really clear demo, and it's really nice to see that feature working. And it was difficult to design and develop, so that's awesome. Thank you. Okay, um, then I guess Alexander is next. Hey, hi everyone. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So today I'm gonna show you a quick little demo of uh, the updated items in transit report. We have added a few fields to this report, namely um, call number components fields and copy number. So to do that, I will need a few items. Um, currently we don't have any items in transit, so I'm gonna need to check a few items out. I think four is enough and check them back in at a different service point. Okay, and now we should have four items in transit. Let's try and create the report. There it is. Okay, and as you can see, all the items have call number prefix, call number, call number suffix, and copy number. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Looks great. Um, okay, so that was Vega. Um, Concord is up next and um, the PO for Concord, which is working on export is Magda. Um, she's out today. So she just asked that I introduce the demos by saying that the team is demonstrating work started for inventory instance export and mark bib format because that was the highest urgency use case um, from the data export subgroup. 
And if you have any questions about the work done, you can reach Magda um, on Slack. All right, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Igor or whoever wants to go first. <laughs> Hello, I go, I go first. Okay. Well, well just a second. Hi everyone. So, uh, well, we have started to build the data expert system last month and the system works similar to vice versa way the data import works. And uh, my presentation is about the approach with that we have started development of the new system, the data expert. So uh, at the very beginning of development, we started with writing a technical documentation for the new system for the data expert, just to have all the technical details in place, all the quota requirements, limitations, restrictions, and uh, future pl plans and releases uh, should be at the one place. And uh, in this documentation, we have represented the expert process in more in more telling way, just to make all the people, all the developers to be on the same understanding, to be on the same page. So uh, that we decided to create a row sequence diagram to, to, to uh, understand the expert process. And here is it. Uh, on this sequence diagram, the expert process is separated in two steps, is broken down into two steps. So uh, the first step is what happens when the user uploads a file with inventory UUIDs, with inventory identifiers uh, to the system. In this case, the data expert just creates a job that is responsible to track the expert execution later. And uh, at the second uh, scenario, the second case is what happens if the user triggers the expert manager to start expert process. In this case, expert manager loads a bunch of mark records from the source record storage and exports them as a source of truth. But for those inventory identifiers that do not have uh, that do not have underlying mark records in SRS, the export manager retrieves uh, inventory records and uh, performs mapping to mark records using using the standard mapping default rules. So uh, then such a mapped record mark records can be exported then uh, well the current the current diagram is applicable only for uh, the q1 only for inventory instance to mark export and of course in future in future plans in future releases uh, we will introduce export for holdings and for inventory items so uh, it's necessary to make some kind of visualization just to, uh, I mean, such a diagram helps to understand uh, an interaction, UI and backend for UI people, people, and also it helps to identify points of improvement. Uh, I mean, what arrows can go in parallel and where are the weak links and what arrows should be synchronized and so on. And uh, in addition, it helps to break the expert process into smaller pieces of uh, functionality and convert them to various Jira tickets. Uh, and such a representation helps developer, developers to work efficiently by thinking through the design. Uh, you can find uh, this diagram in our technical documentation uh, on the team's Google Drive. So that's all about me. Thanks for attention. Thanks, Igor. Uh, looks like Kruthi is next. Uh, I'll keep it short. So 
for the data export while generating the MARC file. Uh, we usually generate them on the fly for uh, those of the instances that do not have an underlying SRS record. So this is the rules file for that. Uh, this was uh, prepared from the uh, uh, Excel sheet that the metadata management SIG has provided for us. <coughs> Going forward, uh, they, each of the librarian will be able to customize uh, what fields have to be marked to which one by generating the mark file. Um, uh, this is the this is the first step towards that. And that's all I have. All right, thanks. And then finally, Victor. Uh, hello. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Great. Uh, so let me uh, share my screen. Uh, could you please qualify whether you can see it? We can. Okay, uh, so the first uh, feature which I am going to demonstrate is uh, uh, the one which is in, in inventory application. And uh, this functionality allows us to save identifiers of inventory instances that fulfill uh, the search criteria. So in, in order to do that, I need to have something uh, selected from this search, let it be just main library. And as you can see, we have uh, 14 records now. So uh, we have added new option to save instances UIDs. Let me just store them. And open, one second. So here is the list uh, which is based on the uh, search criteria from the UI inventory application. Uh, I just want to mention that for now the limit of the search is 30 items and we uh, have planned to address it with the help of uh, core functional team. So the next uh, functionality which I'm going to show in is uh, uh, that we have added the new uh, data export application to the system according to all best practices and uh, guidelines. And I'm, uh, sorry. For now I'm sorry, Victor, could I interrupt you? Please you go ahead. On the export UIDs, there's a limit of 30? It's uh, right now, right. And uh, you said something after that I missed. Are, are, are we planning on addressing that, upping that limit somehow? Yes, with uh, the help of core functional team. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, and there is an ongoing discussion about that. Uh, but for now, we will uh, go with certain uh, limit. And uh, as I said, uh, for now, we have uh, created uh, the export application and have integrated in, into the system. Uh, it will have uh, the search, um, uh, set up, the search area, uh, the settings area as well, but for now it, uh, uh, there is nothing there. And for now we have only added uh, file uploader uh, area, which we'll uh, be using uh, for uh, uh, uploading the uh, list of identifiers, either from uh, inventory, which we have just uh, uh, saw, or from other sources uh, like ODP. So basically, that's it from my side. If you have any question, please uh, address them either here or in Slack, whatever. Sorry, I, uh, I missed that last part. If uh, the file that you created that had the 14 UUIDs, uh, you can select that file and that will trigger it, that will be able to trigger an export. Right, yeah, uh, we, uh, we expect to uh, pull out the list, uh, the file, this v basically the CSV file with the list of identifiers and uh, it could be identifiers uh, generated based on the uh, uh, process which I have just demoed uh, from inventory yeah, by storing uh, the needed identifiers based on search criteria or either other sources uh, like you can actually manually generate uh, like the needed list of identifiers and to start the process. Okay. 
Right. So, okay. so that's the key concept. Uh, I've done a search in inventory and brought back some results, say some records that I need to update something on. And then taking those instance UUIDs, I can now export the pre-existing MARC records that are in source record storage, or it, uh, the export function will create MARC records on the fly for the instances that don't have underlying um, source records. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Victor. Um, okay. Stripes Force is up next with Rasmus. Hello. Hello. Let me just share my screen. And you can see my screen? Yep. Perfect. So I have a few updates to share with you today. And the, the most uh, noticeable update is the new uh, pain hitter actions button, which you'll find uh, across all modules in Folio. And uh, it looks like this. And uh, when clicked, it will reveal the pain action menu. And uh, previously, uh, you would reveal this menu by clicking the pain title. Uh, you might remember the little uh, carrot. Um, so, so the idea here is to um, to make the actions button more noticeable and easier for users to find um, relevant actions for a given page, as well as creating some kind of uh, consistency across modules. So uh, the idea here is to have only one uh, primary action button uh, in the pane header. Uh, so in the case that are more than one action, we will have the actions button. And if not, we'll just have the one uh, action, like the, for example here, the new action. And um, Kalila made a document that outlines this pattern if you need more information. So as you can see here, we have multiple buttons here and that's because not all modules has been updated to use the new pattern uh, just yet, but uh, I believe that these uh, changes will be made in the, in the near future. Um, next up is uh, a bunch of style updates that I've been making in this uh, sprint. One of them is the uh, updated background color on the pain header as well as this uh, blue border on the multi-column list. And um, the purpose of these changes is to make it more clear to the user which area belongs to, to, to what functionality. Um, for example, which area belongs to the multi-column list in this case, as well as um, uh, the area here of the pain header. So basically to create some perceived uh, perception between uh, groups of content or uh, uh, groups of objects or content. So it, this should make it easier to, to, to decode the content of the page and understand what you're looking at. So um, the design changes that we are making is an attempt to, to stick to the same design philosophy while uh, solving problems faced with individual components uh, and patterns by app developers and end users. So we are gradually implementing the new design changes. So you'll uh, likely see more updates uh, in the near future. Uh, next up, I would like to show a little keyboard uh, user experience uh, improvement that we've been making for uh, the user search. Uh, as you uh, enter a search and click search, the focus will be moved to the uh, results pane header. Uh, and this will leave you from having to tap all the way through the, uh, uh, the filter pane here so that you will be uh, quickly at the results. So right now, this is a pattern that we've only implemented in, in UI users, but um, it's definitely something that uh, we could implement in other modules as well. Uh, lastly, I uh, would just like to uh, mention that we updated the uh, Folio Design System or UX Docs site um, to, to hopefully give a better overview of the different topics and, and types of content um, for, for the different guidelines. So if you go to browse all guidelines, you will find this uh, quite extensive list of different uh, uh, component layouts, UX patterns, and so on. Um, and this can be found at uh, ux.folio.org slash docs. And that is it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Rasmus. Okay, uh, next up is Core Fund. Core Functional and Sergey will be doing the demo. Hello. Hello. I um, hope you can see my screen. Not yet. Not 
Yep. Mm. There we go. Oh. Okay. Um, I want to show you some features that our team has worked on over the past two sprints. I'd like to start uh, with a request application and introduced functionality that prevent the user from creating any type of request, holds, pages, recalls, when the item has the status and declared lost. I have already created the item with this status. Here it is. I copied the uh, barcode and let's go to the request application and uh, create a new request for this item. When we enter in the barcode and click at the enter button, the following model text was displayed that the item uh, status declared uh, this item has status declared lost and cannot be requested. After closing this model, uh, the message, no request types available for select items appears under the request type title. Uh, if we continue, um, continue to fill in all the, uh, the required fields, uh, this one, let's see. Uh, and try to save this form. Uh, as we can notice that the same model displays the same message. Uh, next, for the next demo of my, uh, for the demo of my next feature, let's pick the item with the status available. Um, and copy the barcode and move to the check-in application. Uh, we are also going to check, uh, check in the item in the service point, at the service point assigned to the its effective location. In our ca case, uh, it's uh, circulation desk one. After, after entering the item barcode and click enter button, we can see the plus icon. Uh, in the, you can see the plus icon in house use column. At this moment, we are using the plus icon instead of in house use icon, since the last one has not been developed. Uh, if you use a service point that is not assigned to the item's effective location, uh, in our case, let's change to online. And, uh, Let's take another available item and after, after check-in and as you can see, uh, you can see the empty cell in the in-house use column. Uh, the next three features implemented in the inventory application are very similar in their functionality. This feature, uh, inventory, this feature all about the ability to search uh, by uh, HRD directly from the uh, search box when the corresponding segment is selected. Uh, I'm gonna show you how it works on, on the example of the holdings HRID. Select the holding segment, select the holdings HRID 
item and after entering the holding ID, HRID, search and uh, go into the view holding form. As you can see, uh, this holding has the same HRID as in the search field. And the last thing I would like to present is the ability to filter instances by format and mode of issuance, if I pronounce it correctly. This, uh, these two elements uh, were added to the filter pane, format and mode of issuance, and they are pretty similar in work. Uh, we are now in inventory application in the instance segment, and you can see the format and mod instance here. Uh, time is limited, so I show you how the mode of issuance filter works. Uh, when we click the filter title, uh, a search box is displayed with drop down menu of value items. Search is performed by keyword uh, when we enter some value, for example, M O, and you can see that this pattern is highlighted in the corresponding elements. Uh, when we select, let's say, monograph item, uh, uh, then the result pen, in result pen, we will get the instance record in which the mode of issuance is monograph. That's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, thanks, Sergey. Um, that's great. All right. Well, we are actually one minute um, before end of time, so I think Anton, um, we'll skip your update this time. I know you have some slides in um, the deck that people can review. Um, is there anything you want to say in the last minute, or should we just point people to your, your slides, Anton? Um, no, we can skip my update. All right. A little self-explanatory. What's that? Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you so much um, to everyone who demoed, and I really appreciate people um, trying to push through their demos in a timely manner. I know there's so much to show. Um, we can only do just a fraction of it, but it's great to see all the work that's happening. and. Um, Yes, uh, we'll be sharing the um, deck and we'll try to get all the links to the corresponding related materials into the deck as well. Um, and um, we'll get all, the, all this up on YouTube and, and uh, share it out shortly. So thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day.